Hi folks, welcome back to the channel. After my foray into block masonry as a complete novice, um, I thought that it might be useful to do a quick video of tools that I needed. I'm going to do them in absolutely need to have it and things that would be nice to have. Um, and also I want to talk about some of the lessons I learned. So maybe if you decide to do one of these projects for yourself in the future, it'll help you out uh, figuring out what you need and kind of how to approach it. The first thing I want to start with is safety equipment or PPE, personal protective equipment. Uh, you definitely are going to need some stuff if you're going to do this kind of job. Uh, if you don't use some of the safety equipment, you could have some near-term consequences or definitely some long-term consequences. Uh, the first thing you're going to need is some sort of hand protection, so some gloves. I just use, you know, I don't remember where I got these from, but just some cheap work gloves. You can use jersey gloves. I don't find that they last as long, but something with a a leather or faux leather palm on them I found works pretty good. But when it comes to laying the block, you want something that's going to give you a little bit of moisture protection and a little bit of chemical protection because the mortar is a is chemically a base so it's kind of like lye and it will eat your skin up during the process of laying this block and the block is pretty rough so you know you want something to protect your skin for a lot of things i go to harbor freight because it's cheap it's local and you know i can buy stuff that I know will generally work for the job that I'm trying to get done. These hardy latex coated gloves, I laid almost 900 block in this project and I went through one pair of gloves, the latex coating was worn off and you know the other pair is still usable for another project. They're like a dollar 79 a pair so these I highly recommend. You will definitely want some sort of eye protection for cutting these block. I'd recommend it for mixing the mortar because you get that stuff splashed up into your eyes. It's not going to be a fun day. Just some sort of impact resistant wrap around safety glasses at a minimum. When I was doing a lot of cutting, I was using a face shield. This one's pretty beat up. I've had it for a while. I actually need to replace it because it's gotten scratched up to the point that I can't see very well through it. But it'll keep pieces of block and stuff from coming back in your face. You're definitely going to want some kind of ear protection. Uh, if you're running the saws and that kind of stuff, I mean, if you're not, yeah, you may not need it. But... I always have a pair of these in my pocket because I'm constantly running heavy equipment and stuff like that and they're cheap. You can get on Amazon, you can get a box of like 500 of these for little or nothing. The other thing you're going to want if you're doing cutting with an abrasive saw blade or grinder or something like that, you're definitely going to want a dust mask. I just you know bought a box of these i don't remember where i got them amazon maybe even harbor freight but they're just a a dust mask a particulate mask you know you can upgrade you can go to a lot better masks but at a minimum you want something like this and the reason i say that is because the the basic nature of the mortar but also that particulate matter that's coming off of those blocks, if you're exposed to it long-term, can cause a condition called silicosis. It basically will plug up your lungs and, and you can die from it. So at a minimum, this is the safety equipment I would recommend. The next thing I wanna talk about is marking, measuring, and kind of layout tools. As far as marking goes, if you're not going to be using a spinning blade to cut your block, if you're going to use a, a hammer and chisel, a pencil will work fine. Uh, what I found using 
the concrete saw or skill saw or even the grinder is that the spinning blade basically just blows the graphite right off the block. So I started using Sharpies. The problem with Sharpies is the block is very, very abrasive. And when you start out with a new Sharpie, it looks like that. After about 10 or 15 blocks, that's what mine looked like. It was still making a mark, but it was, it was getting a little fat. The, the Sharpie tends to hold up better when you're using a saw or, or something like that to cut with. At a minimum, you're going to want a tape measure because you're going to be measuring stuff all the time. I've got a, you know, 25 foot, I've got 100 foot somewhere around here, I've got a 300 foot. I've used both the 25 foot and the 100 foot a lot doing this project. The other thing you're going to want is some sort of chalk line. I've got three different ones laid out here. This is just the old style, you know, your dad, your grandpa, you, know, you may have one laying around in your toolbox. There's no gear reduction. It's just a spindle with a handle on it. These are some of the newer ones. If you've watched some of my previous videos, you heard me complaining about this DeWalt chalk box. I do not like the string in it. It does not hold the chalk very well. I've had better luck with this uh, Bostitch. It seems to hold the chalk a little bit better, but it is not as wear resistant. This one just has the old fashioned cotton string in it not very wear resistant so you know you'll find yourself cutting it off and moving the hook i have a blue chalk in here for temporary marking and this one is red and this one is black these are considered to be permanent there's some stuff around here that i marked with this red two years ago and it's been out in the weather and the line's still on it so it's pretty permanent as far as string line goes, you're gonna need it to, to do your layout. You can do it with a chalk line, but this is a little cleaner. Don't buy the twisted line. Buy the braided mason's line. It is a little more expensive, but it'll last a lot longer. It gives you a, a lot better line because it doesn't stretch as easily when you stretch it it holds the tension uh, it's well worth it to spend the extra couple of bucks and get the braided mason line the next thing you're going to need is some string blocks these are just marshalltown i got them at uh, home depot and of course i about had a stroke when i saw what they wanted for them but you you've got to have them to do your, your course guides when you're laying your block. And the way these work, you've got your string stretched out the direction that you want it to go. So you put your string through the groove on the block, take your tail, because your running end is going out the face of the block, take your tail, wrap it around twice and on the third time bring it back through the notch so that it's sticking out the back of the block and that'll keep it locked on there as the temperature and humidity changed throughout the day i found myself having to retension the blocks every once in a while but these work pretty well if you're only going to buy one set of blocks and i'll put a picture of this in I would recommend the dog bone because it's a little more versatile. You saw me in the, this last video talking about using uh, just a bent piece of metal to give me something I could put on an inside corner and go to an outside corner. The dog bone type uh, string block works a lot better for that. You can use it a, a little bit more easily, but these are your cheaper options. If you're going to be doing, like I was, repeated cuts of the same dimension, I would recommend a combination square. 
because you can get your dimension, set it, and use it on the block to mark your lines on successive blocks. If you're just doing intermittent cuts, you can use a tape measure. And what you do is find your measurement that you want, get that line against the edge of your block, hold it between your thumb and index finger, get your line lined up on the edge of the block, hold your marking tool, pencil, sharpie, whatever, against the edge of the tape, or the end of the tape, and you can stabilize it with your other finger and then just come down through and make your mark. It'll work for occasional marking, but if you're doing a lot of repetitive cuts, it can get pretty tedious. The other thing you're gonna need is a level, I would recommend a couple of levels. If you're only gonna get one level, I would recommend a four foot. This is a Johnson bamboo Mason's level. I like it. The aluminum can get a little dinged up if you're not careful with it, but it's it's got some weight to it. And the thing I like about it is the vials are curved. So the bubble has it moves very easily within the vial. I also use the two foot level quite a bit. This is a Stanley I-beam. I do not recommend this. The reason I don't recommend this is from side to side and end to end, I would frequently get different measurements and these vials are not curved, they're straight. So the bubble has a tendency to hang inside this level. It bends easy, it, it's terrible. If you're not gonna buy something like this, I would recommend a box level. So it's a solid rectangular tube with the level in it. But if you can get one, get it with the curved vials because it's a lot easier to use, it's a lot more accurate. You can also use a torpedo level, but I don't think it gives you enough versatility for anything beyond leveling the blocks across the short face. Um, you need something that gives you a little bit more run so you can plumb things across along the entire height or you can get your faces lined up or your tops leveled across several blocks. It's just a lot more accurate. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about is striking tools and cutting tools because you're gonna to need to tap the block, but you're also going to need to cut block to fit unless your layout is absolutely on normal block size increments. And unlike me, you're perfect with your mortar joints. So you can probably do this without a brick hammer. You can do it, you know, with a claw hammer or a ball peen hammer and uh, a chisel, but I, no more than these cost. I'd recommend getting a, a brick or mason's hammer because you can use it to cut. You can use it to tap things. You can use it to, you know, level up stuff. And the striking face on this is big enough. You can use it with a chisel to cut your block. I'm not going to go in depth into how to cut the block with a chisel. There's several videos on YouTube that will take you through different ways of cutting concrete block, brick, pavers, whatever. Um, but you basically you just mark your line, score the line, and you strike this thing in a repetitive pattern around your line and, and it'll cut. It's not nearly as clean as using uh, some kind of a saw. The other type of striking tool you're going to want is some sort of a soft face hammer. What you saw me using in this, because I had it, it's, it's heavier, is a flooring mallet. It's got a rubber face on it and a, a steel head, so it's got a little bit of weight to it. Most instances it was fine. I probably should have gone over to a dead blow hammer because the rubber face on this 
sometimes I would get a little rebound and it was kind of hard to get things lined up exactly. The other option, and this is from Harbor Freight, is just some sort of a dead blow hammer. It's got a weight to it, but it's got a soft face so you won't chip the block. As far as cutting goes, if you're not going to use the chisel method, if you want to spend a little bit more money, I had fantastic results out of the absolute cheapest saw that they sell at Harbor Freight. I think regular price on it is like $34. Sometimes you get it on sale for 25 bucks if you got a, a coupon or catch a sale. And on the saw I've been using from Harbor Freight, a Bauer abrasive diamond blade. The blade that's on here has cut, I don't know how many of these block that this house is built out of, which is a mixture of cement and styrofoam. It's cut the entire perimeter of the house to give us a level line for the second floor slab. And I have cut, well, probably well over a hundred of these concrete blocks with this thing. The saw, I wouldn't recommend it for finished carpentry. Uh, the accuracy I don't think is there because there's play in the spindle and, and the platen is not that good. But rather than tearing up a good carpentry saw, I think it's well worth the money. This thing is like the AK-47 of skill saws. It is not that accurate, I don't think, but it runs forever. It is full of this concrete dust and it's still going strong. The other thing, again, Harbor Freight, I picked up several of these Drillmaster brand. It's the same brand as the saw four inch angle grinders. They had them on sale for I think $9. One of these with a four inch diamond blade will let you cut stuff as well. It doesn't cut as deeply as the skill saw, but it'll give you a good score mark. And if you're careful, you can come inside the opening in the block and, and still cut. I've used it to get into the corners where I can't get the skill saw and get the block cut most of the way through and then taking the mason's hammer and knock the piece off and then you can take this diamond blade using it on the flat to smooth small areas down i wouldn't recommend doing it a lot because if you put too much deflection on it you'll bend it as for leveling off humps you know small areas not a big great big area but uneven cuts on block or if you've got some aggregate sticking up on your footing or you know a, a wad of concrete that didn't get cleaned off these bauer diamond cup wheels cut fast and i have been just using the crap out of this thing and it's still got a lot of life left in it i think that the grinder, the four inch blade, and the cup wheel, you'd be in less than 50 bucks. Probably way less than that if you catch it on sale. The other option that gets really expensive to buy especially, but even to rent, I think renting one of these is about $300 a week where we are. But if you just need it for a day, it's like 80 bucks or something like that. Very fast, messy. It's kind of hard to control. I find that I get more accurate cuts with the skill saw than with this. But, you know, the day that I cut well over 100 block down to size, this is what I used because it'll, in two cuts, go all the way through the block. I didn't have to worry about a section in the middle that didn't get cut. And again, on this Harbor Freight Diamond Blade, I bought this blade probably five years ago for a job that I did. 
it has cut and cut and cut. If you look at some of the videos of the the stuff that we've done building the house, I cut through probably a hundred feet of limestone with this thing, maybe more, um, so that I could jackhammer out a trench. It's cut a couple hundred feet of asphalt driveway. It's cut concrete blocks, you name it. And it's still got well over half the life left in the diamond. So, you know, the, if you go rent a saw, don't rent a blade, just go to Harbor Freight, buy the blade, and it, it'll save you money and you'll have something you can use again later on. Okay. For mixing up your mortar, you're gonna need something to mix it in. Uh, you saw me using a wheelbarrow. I started out using a mortar tub and it was unwieldy, but it would work if you don't have a wheelbarrow and you don't wanna go buy one or can't borrow one but something to mix it in. I'd recommend a mortar hoe. The thing that I have noticed about using the mortar hoe is the holes in it allow the mortar to go through, so it gives you a little bit better mix. You can kind of tell about the consistency of the mortar based on the way it's coming through the hole. And if you want to, you can use it as a garden hoe later on. You can use a shovel. It's a pain, I've done it, it's not fun. You can use a five gallon bucket and a beater style mixer. Again, I've done it, it's not fun. The most effective way to do it manually i found is a wheelbarrow and a mortar hoe. A mixer gives you a lot better quality mortar to work. You don't end up with inconsistency in the mix as much. But if you're like me and you work kind of slow, you're gonna have to wash it out every time you mix a batch of mortar. May not be that big of a deal. You know, for me, I just ran it out on the ground because I had a hole I needed to fill in anyway. The other thing you're gonna want is some form of a graduated container because to get your mortar mixed, you're gonna need to control the amount of water going in it. Don't just start spraying a hose at it, especially if somebody's helping you, because what I found is between six and a half and seven quarts of water gave me the best consistency of mortar. And the only way you're gonna know that is if you've got something that you can measure the water in. You know, that I don't remember how much this was, came from Home Depot, you can get graduated, uh, measuring buckets in a lot of different places. The other thing that I found was handy, you don't have to have it, but I found it extremely useful, was a pump up spray bottle. And the reason I found it to be useful is the mortar starts basically cooking off as soon as it's mixed, the chemical reaction starts happening. But in the heat of the day, you lose a lot of moisture in the mortar from evaporation. And the rule of thumb is at 80 degrees and above, about two and a half hours your mortar is bad and you need to throw it out. So what I used the spray bottle for is, as I noticed the mortar was getting a little stiff, I would spray some water in there, take the hoe, mix it in the wheelbarrow, and get it back to a good working consistency. And generally I could get that done uh, maybe a couple of times when it was above 80 degrees and use the entire batch of mortar. Uh, you know, if I was off cutting block or something like that, I had a couple of batches that got too far gone and I couldn't bring back. So I just mixed a new batch, but I found this to be very useful. As far as trowels and finishing tools go, I used basically a smaller size trowel. This would be, I guess, considered a brick mason's trowel, and I think it's the London pattern trowel. This trowel carried more than enough mortar for me to get the job done, but it was not so much mortar that when I was learning my trowel skills, I was wasting a lot of it. But it also, even the small size, 
tore me up by the end of the day. You'll end up, if you do a lot of this, with a repetitive motion soreness in your hand, wrist, elbow. So if you're not a professional that's been doing this for a long time, I would not recommend going and buying one of the giant block mason trowels. You know, it just was not a, uh, a good option for me at my skill level. Uh, this thing did everything I needed it to do. And the thing is with that the point is rounded enough, you can use it to lightly tool your joints and stuff. But I'm gonna talk about the, the tooling and finishing stuff here in just a second. The other type of trowel that I had, we had this from doing stone work and, and needed a little bit smaller trowel for some of the tasks we were doing. But the main thing I like this for is opening the bags of mortar because you can stick it in and cut the paper and dump your mortar out. It was very handy. You can do it with a bigger trowel, but this was a little bit easier to work with. The last kind of trowel I've got is just a square nosed flat trowel. I used it for you know, scraping stuff off of the footing, for scraping stuff off of the face of the block. And because I was messy, with applying my mortar to the mortar joints. It made it nice to scrape down the face of the block and get the extra mortar off. When it's time to tool your joints, you want a striking tool. There's a bunch of different versions of this. This one actually is a cobalt and it's a half inch on one end and a five eighths on the other end. I found that I needed both of these all of the time because I was inconsistent in my mortar joints, but you use this to give that, that convex finish to your mortar joint. It presses the mortar in, it seals it up against the edge of the, the joint against the block, and it smooths off the face of the mortar so if your wall is going to be exposed to the weather, it makes it more weather resistant. Once I finished tooling the joints, you next would have seen me taking this rubber float and wiping down the face of the block. It gets the crumbs and that kind of stuff off. You don't have to have that. When we were doing stone work, I used just a regular scrub brush and it just knocks the loose stuff off and it'll work fine. If you're messy like me, and you need your block to look good because it's gonna be exposed, you can come back after you've tooled it and it's set up so that if you rub the uh, axle joint itself, it doesn't damage it. You can take a wire brush, I'd recommend stainless steel, and brush off the mortar that you've smeared around the outside of the joint if you did it like I did. But at a minimum, you need one of these and I'd recommend a brush, but all of these I found to be nice to have and useful. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is some of the lessons that I learned. Um, I'm going to start with the footing. If you put your own footing in, work as diligently as you can to get it level. My footing being unlevel caused some serious problems that I'll talk about how to remedy here in just a minute. But the other thing that caused me problems in the layout phase was the positioning of the footing relative to the structure. When you lay out your footing, and I'll put a graphic in so you can see what I'm talking about. You want your footing to be twice the width of the wall and you want it to be the same thickness as the wall is wide. When you position it relative to the structure, if you're doing a stem wall like I did, or if you're trying to meet a dimension for an actual stem wall for a house or a building or whatever, you want half 
the width of the wall on the outside of the footing and half the width of the wall on the inside of the footing with the block placed so that the outside face of the block is on your desired dimension line. I didn't understand that when I did these footings and it caused me some serious headaches. Think about that if you're doing your own footings. As far as the footing being level, in general, we did a pretty good job. In most of the places, it was, you know, within a quarter inch, maybe as much as a half inch. But there were some places where I was three quarters of an inch to an inch, inch and an eighth out of tolerance for desired elevation. And you'll see in, if you haven't already seen this uh, final video of me building this block wall, that to rectify that, once I had already placed block, I had to come back and trim the block to a level line. The way that you prevent that is you set your corner blocks to your desired elevation. Then you take dry block and put it between those two corners upside down. Then you take a chalk line and strike a line that is your elevation line between the two corners that gives you a guide to then come back and cut those block off. You cut the block off, turn them back over and put them on the footing. And now you should have taken out that undulation or change in elevation so that your first course of block is level and on elevation. It'll save you a ton of headaches. The other piece of advice I could give you is when you run your guide string between your corners and you start laying a course of block, make sure that you are leaving a friend of mine says the thickness of a dime between the line so you want the thickness of a dime between the block and the string line so that you don't get against it and push it out of line but it also gives you a sight line if something's flat up against that line you can't really tell where you are relative to the line. You may be pushing it over, you know, or you may be perfect. If you'll leave just a little bit of an air gap between those two surfaces, it's a lot easier to see that you're staying in line. Also make sure that you don't have a piece of mortar sticking out of a joint back behind you and pushing that line out. Had that happened to me, I got a little bit of a curve in my wall. As far as your work area goes, one of the things I mentioned in this last video is you need to be thinking about the placement of your block on the pallets when it's delivered and your workflow. I thought about it from the perspective of, okay, I'm gonna need basically this many blocks, so I want a pallet positioned here, I want a pallet positioned here, and I don't want to walk 15 steps to get a block, so let's put these block right here. The problem is I got it too close to the work area, and it made it so that I could not get the wheelbarrow through there. It made it so it was difficult to get the head joint mortar on the blocks and get everything set up. So, you know, if you set it back, a couple more steps away from your work area so that you can get through there with your wheelbarrow or have a place to set your mortar tub and still work on the block and still access the wall, you'll be a lot better off. Another consideration when it comes to workflow has to do with the way that you're laying the block on your wall. Uh, if you saw the previous video, I mentioned that I had multiple cuts in the courses because of the way that I 
started laying the block. And if you will start at one end and work to the other end, and then if you do the same, you can, you know, start at this end and come back or whatever, but just work consistently. Don't start at each end and work to the middle. You'll end up with your piece blocks in one location. So you've laid all of your blocks this direction, you get to here and you see that between this block and your corner, you need a short block. You put your short block in, but on your next course, all of your bond joints will be lined up one over two or the center of your next course of block will be lined up over a bond joint between two blocks on the bottom until you get down to this point and then you can offset your cut block in that same general area. What I did was started at each end and went to the middle and I ended up with cut blocks down here and cut blocks down here and so it, it just made the process a lot more difficult. If you'll go in one direction it'll make things a lot simpler for you. So the consistency of the mortar your footing, your block layout, and proper use of the streamline uh, are, are going to be your most important considerations. But, thanks for watching. Hope y'all found this useful and uh, y'all have a good day.